In the category theory video, I mentioned a lot of jargons and tools in functional programming are actually coming from category theory. Functor is one of those tools and is being used a lot in functional programming. In this video, we will first explore what functor is in category theory and then extend that concept to functional programming. But first, Let's revisit and refresh our understanding of what a category is. Category is a bunch of objects with arrows connecting them. What makes category useful is the composition of the arrows. And this is the first rule of category. If two arrows are following each other, there should be a third arrow starting from the beginning of the first one and points to the end of the second one. The second rule, which is called associativity, states that the order of composing arrows in a category is not important, meaning no matter if we compose the first two arrows first or last two arrows first, the final result is exactly the same and we don't end up with two different yellow arrows. This rule gives us confidence that time or precedence of applying compositions play no role in categories. The third and last rule is called identity, and it makes sure that each object has a unique arrow to itself. Composing identity with any arrow and vice versa gives you the same arrow. This rule ensures that we always have a neutral element for composing arrows. If any graph and points and arrows follow these three rules, then we have a category. But what makes category so special? Why do we keep returning to it? Well, we already know functional programming is based on category theory. So understanding concepts at category level obviously gives us the bigger picture. But more importantly, apparently category relates closely to the way our human minds work. Since the earliest days, we humans learn to recognize which plants and animals are safe to eat and which ones to avoid. We got pretty good at spotting patterns in the world around us. And honestly, time to time we overdo it. It's safer to mistakenly detect a predator's eyes in the dark when they're not there. And that played a huge role in our survival. As general as it sounds, it turns out category is the definition of a structure and pattern. If something has a structure, then we can define a category for it. Let's think about the human body as an example of a complex structure. If you ask a child to draw a human body, they probably draw something like this. They see some pattern and come up with a simpler structure. Since they are spotting a structure in a structure, it's like they are recognizing a category as a pattern inside another category. As it turns out, we can formalize this recognition of a pattern as a mapping between the two categories. This mapping is called functor and is commonly shown with capital F. Now the question is, what is this mapping? How should we define this mapping so it resembles the idea of recognizing a pattern inside the category? Something that is obvious is, we want this mapping to preserve this structure from the first category. We want to recognize a human from a drawing of a human. And that is the most important part about functors. They preserve a structure. So how can we define this mapping? For a starter, the first idea that comes to mind is to map objects. So now object A in category C is mapped by F to F of A in category B. Same for objects B and FB. But objects by themselves don't have any structure. It's the arrows and composition of the arrows that gives us power to model structures. 
So we also need to be able to map arrows. If there is an arrow between two objects, there should be an arrow between the mapped objects as well. By the way, I didn't say that objects should be mapped to distinct objects in the target category. They can be mapped and collapsed to the same object. Same thing for arrows. The important thing is, if two objects are connected, they should stay connected. But along with mapping objects and arrows, there is a rule that functors should follow, and that is about composition of arrows. Structures are modeled by composition in categories. So in order to preserve the structure when mapping, we also need to preserve composition. But how can we formalize quote-unquote preserving a composition? Let's step by step think about this. Starting from our source category, in order to analyze the composition, we need another arrow following the first one. Based on what we learned about functors, we should have a map of object C and map of arrow G in the category D. Pay attention to these two pairs of arrows. Since C is a category, then we should have the composition of arrows F and G. But in category D, things get interesting. We can get to this arrow X in two ways. The first way is by using our functor to lift F and G to category D and then composing the lifted arrows. The second way is by composing F and G in category C first and then use our functor to lift GOF to the category D. So which one is the correct one? Both seem to be legit ways to reach arrow X. Are these two ways result in two different yellow arrows? Here is where functor composition law shines and makes things easier for us to work with. If our mapping F is a functor, both ways should be equal and lead to a same yellow arrow X and not two distinct arrows. This is called functor composition law. Do you now feel why this rule helps to preserve the structure of category C when we are doing the mapping? We still haven't talked about the identity arrows when it comes to functors. In functors, identity of a lifted object in the target category should be same as lifting the identity arrow from the source category. And this is called functor identity law. All right, so many points and arrows. Let's recap. Functor is a mapping between categories that preserve a structure between them. This mapping includes mapping of objects, mapping of arrows in a way that it preserves identity morphism and it preserves composition of morphisms. The more verbose name for the functor is covariant functor, which gives us hint that there are variations to functors. But more on that later. In general, functor formalizes the concept of recognizing a pattern in a structure. All right. Enough with category theory. Let's look at how we can benefit from functors in functional programming. If you remember, the category that models functional programming is called category of types and functions, in which types like integer and boolean are objects, and functions like is even are arrows in our category. An example of a functor in functional programming is option type constructor. Option maps each type to an option of that type. In order for option to be a functor, it should map all functions like is even as well. The function that does this mapping is usually called fmap or simply map. So calling map on is even returns a function that receives an option of integer and returns option of boolean. 
To be more accurate, this map function specifically lifts functions to an for option context. In order to understand how map function for option works here, think of a value like 12. Passing 12 to is even returns true. What about the value 12 wrapped in option? How should we expect map of is even function work when we pass sum of 12 to it? As you guessed, we can simply apply is even to the value inside the sum. It feels like we are reaching inside option and update the value inside it while we are in the context of an option. But the whole point of using option is to model the absence of a value. What if the input value is none rather than an option of a number? Then there is no value to calculate over. In that case, we can simply return none. Notice that whether we have a value or not, we are still dragging the context without coding for the if-else check every time that we want to transform our value. That messy if-else check for sum and none is encoded in map of option once and then being reused afterwards. To understand how useful this is, let's use our pipe analogy for functions. Imagine three functions is even to string and to upper connected back to back. If we pass an integer like 12 from the left to the pipes, we will get a string true in capital case from the right. But imagine a scenario in which we want to use this pipeline of functions in an environment where the input may not be available. Like for example, input is coming from an external API, but the API is broken or simply it doesn't give us any value. Instead of rewriting all our functions to support the missing input value, we can lift them to the option context using the map function. Our input and output would be wrapped in option as well. So now the new pipeline not only behaves similar to before, it is now capable of handling the absence of a value as well, without us needing to change the implementation of is even to string or to upper functions. Another way to achieve the same behavior is, since the composition of our three functions is a function by itself too, we can apply map to it and lift it to our desired context. This sounds familiar, right? These two approaches are exactly what functor composition law states. Both approaches should behave exactly the same. But this law may not be valid out of a box for all the type constructors. Unfortunately, we cannot enforce composition law when we code in TypeScript but we can prove them separately on a piece of paper. For the sake of the length of this video, I want to spend time on proving it in this video, but I will post the proof in my channel blog. For the identity law, things are much simpler. The identity function for all types is a unary function that returns its input as is. Well, to be more accurate, each type has a different identity function, but in reality we can reuse the same implementation. So when we map an identity function, we are actually pointing to the same identity function of the lifted type. And this is the option functor. Here's something interesting. You've probably noticed option of integer and option of boolean are types similar to integer and boolean. The map of is even similar to is even is also a function. Interestingly, map is a function too. As a matter of fact, both of these categories are the same and they are both category of types and functions. A functor that maps a category to itself is called an endofunctor. 
As a matter of fact, all functors are endofunctors in functional programming. But I still like to think of them like this diagram. Okay, let's look at another example. This time, the list functor. List functor maps each type to a list of that type. It also maps each function to a function that is adapted to the context of the list. For list, it means that not only the function can handle one element, like how is even used to work, it can also work with no elements or sequence of elements. I will implement the map function for list in the demo video, but you probably have already seen and used this. This is similar to calling the map method on an array in JavaScript. I think now you can guess why this method name is map. The name is coming from functor, and it is specifically implemented for arrays. As you see, both option and list are acting like containers for a single type. But what if our type constructor receives more than one type parameter? like either. Unlike option and list, either is a type constructor that receives two type parameters, which each can be different. How can we map objects using either? Well, we can map to an either of the same type for left and right, but that doesn't seem like a useful construct. What else can we do? We can also partially fixing one of the type parameters. Let's say we fix the left type parameter of either to a string. Now we can map the objects. Integer would be mapped to either of a string and integer, and Boolean maps to either of a string and Boolean. What about mapping functions? For our example here, the mapped is even can receive either of a string and integer and returns an either of a string and boolean. So when map of is even receives a value like 12 wrapped in right, it applies is even to the value and returns right of true. But if it receives a left value like a string error, it simply returns that left value as is. If this mapping preserves the composition and identity laws, then either is a functor. So again, by lifting our types and functions to either context, we are adding error handling capability to our pure functions without re-implementing them. All right, we learned about map of option, list, and either. Option and list wrap one type, and either wraps two types. It seems that in order to define a functor, our type constructor needs to have at least one type parameter. By the way, these are not valid TypeScript syntaxes, but I think they convey what I want to explain. We will look into how to implement these in the demo video. Now the question is, how can we generalize and abstract all these map functions under one definition? What we are looking for is probably something like this. But how can we encode this in TypeScript? In order to do that, we first need to learn about higher content types and how to have them in TypeScript. But for now, thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe and I will see you in the next one.